As the Buddha said, suffering and stress has two kinds of causes. The causes that will go away when you simply look at them, and the causes against which you have to, as he says, exert a fabrication. The first ones are the easy ones, and they're not much of a problem. They're the causes that exist in the mind when you're not paying attention. And when you turn your attention to them, they kind of wither away. It's almost like they're embarrassed. And they cause suffering simply because your attention is diverted someplace else. There is a problem with these, though, these kinds of causes, is that if you get used to seeing them go away on their own just by looking at them, you begin to think that all the causes of suffering will go away just by looking at them. It's like having experience watching a fire burn out and die out from lack of fuel, and thinking that all you had to do was watch it and it was going to die out on its own. But not every fire is like that. There are fires that you can watch and they'll burn you up. That's the second kind. These are the defilements that don't have much sense of shame. You can look at them and they stare right back at you. In other words, they're not going to go away easily. So when the Buddha says to exert a fabrication, what does he mean? To begin with, you have to realize that the defilement itself is composed of three kinds of fabrication. Bodily, verbal, mental. Bodily in the sense that it probably has hijacked your breathing. Verbal in the terms of what it says and what it says about itself. And there are many layers there. And then finally, mental. The feelings of pleasure or pain that go along with it. And then the perceptions, the images you hold in mind, or little flashes of words here and there, kind of the messages of your lizard brain about that particular issue. And because the cause of suffering is composed of these things, the, the way to undo it is to counteract it with other kinds of fabrication, different bodily, verbal, and mental fabrications. The first line of attack is when you realize that, say, anger has taken over, or fear. Notice how you're breathing and see if you can breathe in a way that's more calming. That way you can get the breath on your side. And remove some of the power of the defilement. And at the same time, having a comfortable breath to focus on allows you to step out of that particular cause of suffering. Then there's verbal. These are the questions and comments you make. So you have to learn how to question what the defilement is telling you. You look at the teachings of all the Ajans, they all had to deal with questions of one kind or another. With John Mahabhu, it was questions around pain. What is the pain? How does the pain relate to the body? What is it that allows the pain to come from the body into the mind? A lot of us feel that all this is inevitable and natural, but it's learning how to ask the question, why is this happening? Does it have to happen? That's when you learn something new. It was like Isaac Newton. And everybody said after Aristotle that, well, the nature of things is to fall. And he asked, well, why is that? There's something else going on aside from just falling. And that's when he began to realize there was gravity. Now, the next question, of course, is what is gravity? But at least it's a move in the right direction. You can do more with his theory of gravity than you could with Aristotle's. So when a pain comes up, ask yourself, why am I worked up about this? And part of the mind says, well, it's invaded the body. Well, has it really invaded the body? Has the body become the pain? Or are they just in the same spot? Are they on different levels or on the same level? You probe around and look. Now it helps that you've been doing some concentration practice, so you can look clearly. Because as we're dealing with these causes of suffering, you have to remember these are the things we have to abandon. 
that many of them are deeply rooted, and things that you tend to identify with. Sometimes there'll be values that you hold very dearly that make you do stupid things. So you need a good place to step back and watch so you can actually comprehend the suffering or the stress rather than simply trying to push it away. Because as long as you're pushing it away, you're never going to get anywhere. You have to be in a position where you can sit with it. That's why we work with the breath, to give you a good place to sit, so you're not having to sit right on the pain. Or whatever the issue is. And you start asking questions. And you read the biographies of the different Achans or the Dharma talks, and they all had questions that motivated their practice. They didn't just sit there and look and watch. They had to ask, what's going on? So you have to learn how to question that cause of suffering. And ask, what are the assumptions underlying the way I'm suffering around this issue? Kind of replace them with different assumptions. The same goes with metal fabrication. We have certain perceptions that we hold in mind, images we hold in mind, or words. You have to learn how to question them. Say, for instance, you're suffering from some pain, and you can ask yourself, what's the underlying perception here? Is it the pain is coming at you, that the pain has ill will for you? Part of your mind of course, will say, well, of course not, but another part will, actually, part will actually say yes, if you probe deeply enough. Once you probe down, then you can ask, how can we change that perception? How can you see the pain going away from you? When it's an issue of anger, how can you perceive the person you're angry about differently? And how can you perceive your relationship to anger differently? This is the way right effort works. It's not a matter of just sweating and gritting your teeth. It's putting in some mental effort to figure things out. You can't simply just trust in the magic of acceptance or in the magic of your practice that is going to take care of everything for you. You have to question things. That means not accepting things as they are. You accept them to the extent of real, admitting, okay, oh, yeah, this is the problem that's here, but then you don't sit with the problem as it is. Years back there was a book on the Four Noble Truths where the author was saying, the problem is not craving, the problem is that we are reactive toward craving. We get neurotic around the craving. If we just allow the craving to be, there wouldn't be a problem. And John said, what was here at the time? So I translated that passage for him, and he said, well, the author's teaching people to be stupid. Craving is something you have to abandon. And you're not going to abandon it by just shaking your hand. It's not like something's stuck on your finger. It's there embedded in the way you think. And so you have to learn how to question the way you think. And it's got its tentacles into all these different kinds of fabrications. So you have to learn to change the fabrications. Ask yourself which ones are causing the problems. Experiment. And then learn how to replace the troublesome ones with the ones that are better that are more conducive to understanding. So right effort is sometimes requires just sitting with something and putting in some physical right effort. But largely it's the effort of the mind to know when to be still and just watch and to know when to make a more aggressive move, be more proactive. And of course, what this means is that right effort has to have some discernment. This is why right view comes at the beginning of the path. It has to inform all of the factors to give you the concepts and give you the ideas and suggest strategies 
throughout, you can learn how to read. Okay, when is the right time to be more aggressive and when is the right time to be a little bit more pulling back and just watching. But the important point is that there is no understanding without questioning. And you find as you go through the practice that many, many, many of your assumptions are going to have to be questioned. The things you believe very deeply. They may help you for a while, and of course the more they help you, the more you tend to trust them. But there may come times when they can't help you anymore. And you have to learn to be sensitive to that fact. Because after all, ignorance is not just not knowing. Ignorance is having opinions about things, but they're wrong opinions. And learning how to see through your wrong opinions requires that you have a very deep ability to step back from all kinds of things and question all kinds of things. So get the mind as still as you can, so it's in a position to detect things they didn't see before, and to ask questions about things they never thought of before. And John Lee has a good test. He says if some insight comes into the mind, turn it inside out and ask yourself, to what extent is the opposite true? And what would be the opposite of that insight? That way you learn how to step back from everything and test it. Because even your insights, remember, discernment at the end point of the path is going to have to be abandoned too. So even the good things have their limits. Our problem, of course, is that many times we're deluded about the bad things. We think the bad things are good. So there'll be a lot of levels of questioning that have to go on. But if you're inquisitive and want to learn things, then you're on the right path. 